So before this video starts, if you guys are new to the channel, subscribe. We're channel 160,000 subscribers by the 1st of May, and we upload more My Team content than anybody else. Also, subscribe to everybody that helped out. And if you guys could leave a like, that'd be greatly appreciated. This video literally, literally took weeks to plan. This is the longest I've ever planned a video, longest video I've ever put out, except for the documentary last year, which took days. So if you guys do enjoy this video, please, please leave a like. But anyway, now let's get on to it. What is going on guys, DBG here, and in this video, we are going to be doing something a little bit different. So lads, this is going to be the ultimate guide for NBA 2K20, my team. So this is not just gonna be me, we are going to be going over absolutely everything, and we are going to be getting different YouTubers, different content creators, who have completely different areas of expertise, and we're gonna be getting these guys in, and hopefully, hopefully we're gonna be able to show you guys in this video how to best play the game. One thing I am going to say right now, if you guys are complaining about cheese, talking about realism in a basketball game, or talk about how, quote, the game should be played, this probably is not the video for you. NBA 2K20 is a beyond broken video game, and this is going to be tips on how to get the most bang for your buck in terms of getting cards, about how to build the perfect team, and what is the way to most effectively play the game. And no, it is not necessarily the most effective way to simulate basketball. It is going to be the most effective way to play this specific game mode. So if you guys are going to be talking about this as a full cheese tutorial, it probably is, to be completely honest. So if you're looking, but if you are looking to get better at the game, this is the right place for you. Like this video is going to be quite long. Probably the second longest video I've posted on this channel. It might even be longer than the documentary last year. But anyway, we are going to be splitting this into a bunch of different parts. Obviously, I am taking the intro right now, it's my channel. I'm going to be going over team building, what players to look for, what badges you can look for, how to spot budget players, how to spot elite budget cards. I'm also going to be going over some of the very, very basics you need, because I could spend a half an hour doing an entire dribbling tutorial. I could spend, which I'm not very good at, I could spend a half an hour of this video getting someone else in. But what this video is, is to get the basics down before anything else. So I'm going to be going over a couple of very basic dribble moves, a couple of very basic things that you can use to go into the basket, and just some basic tips on how to do them. As well as that, we're going to have JD Crossover. He's going to be in to talk about investing. JD has one of the best known money spend squads in the world right now, and the majority of his MT was made from investing, which is one way of making MT. Then we're going to have Energenic who is another no money spent YouTuber, whereas unlike JD, who got most of his MT from investing, Energenic is a very good sniper. He's very good at sniping. So we got a little bit on him from him to do with sniping. Then we are going to probably go on to Bio2K, where he's going to go over set plays and offense. And then we're gonna go on to the global champion, Ty Debo, who's going to go over his defensive settings and how he most effectively plays defense. But yeah. So we are going to start off this video with my part. And I am gonna be obviously going over team building and it's some of just the very, very basics on how to play the game. But yeah, so now let's get on to the team building. So before we get on to actually making the team, I'm going to be talking about play style. And I'm telling you this right now, you need to know what your play style is. I can teach you how to make a perfect team. Bio can teach you all the money plays. Ty can teach you what to do on defense. But if you don't have a play style, if you don't know what you're looking for the other team to do, you are going to struggle. You need to know what type of looks your team is getting. You need to know where you have the most success. Do you want to be a post player? Do you want to run through your point guard? Do you want to be a peekaboo jump shooter from Limitless? Do you want to be a rim runner? You need to know what your, what your play style is. And a lot of people that I know say, Oh, I have a varied set, I just do everything. There is not one player that doesn't have a play style. There's a lot of players that can do everything. Most of the best players in the world can do everything. And that's what separates the likes of Splash and stuff from the likes of me. I do one or two things really well, whereas guys like Splash and Ty do everything well. But you've gotta have an A game. You've gotta have a first option and counters out of that. And there are so many ways to play this game. You've gotta try out new things, especially if you're just starting out and figure out your play style. Because if you're going out there without knowing what your play style is, you are going to get beaten by somebody that does, trust me. And also, before we get onto it, one thing is so important. Never under any circumstance ever, unless it's a center. Sometimes you can get away with them at center. But make sure, make sure you have someone on your bench that has it. Never, ever, 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 ever run with a card ever 
that does not have clamps. I don't mind, care who it is. Never, ever, ever run with a card without clamps. If a card does not have clamps, you will, if you run with, for example, if I put in Thon Maker, who's a really good offensive center, and I put in Thon Maker at the point guard position, I decide, you know what, I want to use, who doesn't have clamps? I don't think Earl Monroe has clamps. Yeah, if I decide I want to use Earl Monroe at point guard, I am telling you, I will lose the game. If you play two, if you have two players on the floor with no clamps, you have lost against any decent player. That, like whatever about the other badges, you can find ways around every other badge in this game. Range extend is important, and quick first step is important, quick draw is important. You can find ways to work around every other badge in the game, but you need to have clamps on all your players. Because if you don't, it is game over. Okay, so this obviously is not the um, the team we're running with. I'm just gonna be doing this because I'm gonna be backing in and out of the auction house quite a little bit. So we're gonna be starting off with, I'm gonna be talking about really the two positions where your style of play can really vary things. And obviously style of play is huge depending on what player you are going to pick up. So when I talked a little bit about earlier about style of play, this is where everything kind of changes. The two through four, I don't think you really are gonna change much. Most people run the same type of players in those positions, but it's the one and the five which are really affected by your style of play. So first of all, we are going to talk about the point guard position. So in my opinion, there are three different types of point guards you can run and there is definitely different cards at different tiers. So we are going to, first of all, have a look at this type of card, and it is the small shooter. So it, this is not a style of play that I particularly like, and but there are some unbelievable players that use it. So we're gonna back out right here, and we're gonna go over some of those players, because as you guys can see, like I don't have any, because it is a style of play that it definitely, it involves a certain amount of skill at certain things, which I don't really have. They are high degree of difficulty players, but when you get them down, they are perfect. So the card that most people use for this play style is this card right here. This is this appears to be the most effective player is Dwayne Wade. So it's all about, with these type of players, the jump shot and the release, and their ability to peekaboo dribble, which we will talk about a little bit later. So a card like a Dwayne Wade can do that really well. Dwayne Wade actually can dunk and block shots a little bit, so that's why he's the best of these. But other cards in this type of tier are Steph Curry, who can do it very, very well. Jamal Crawford. Then we've got some of the kind of cheaper alternatives where you can go for a Jimmer Fredette, who I actually kind of like. He's actually gone up. He was down below 30K at one stage. I don't think Jimmer is bad for this role. I also think that Pete Maravich is really, really effective at this kind of like shooter, peekaboo off screens type center, or sorry, type point guard. He can be very, very effective for it but you do need to be a certain type of player. And this is not a strategy I would recommend for new guys starting the game. Like if you are a seasoned vet and you know the dribble moves, you have their players releases down, you know how to peekaboo, you know how to hesitate, shoot off hezzies. That's when I would suggest this. Other than that, I would not necessarily suggest using these type of cards, especially if you are a new player to the game, I would not suggest to use these type of point cards because yeah, you might enjoy them, but they are, they are liabilities if you don't know how to use them properly. They can, often be abused on the defensive end. Very few of them are good defenders. And apart from Dwayne Wade, really, they all kind of have major weaknesses and even Wade's kind of small. So the next type of point guard we have is the one that most people gravitate towards, especially when they're starting off the game. And in terms of just overall price and stuff, they are probably effective. So it's the slashers. So for example, one of them is one that I have. I don't have that many in this collection. We're gonna have a look at Jay Williams. So with Jay Williams right here, you've got a really nice three-point shot. You got a 95 dunk with a tendency of 100, as well as you've got really, really good speed and the ability to go to the basket well. These cards tend to be, I don't know, I tend to think that they're kind of the worst point guards to use, but they're, they're usable and a lot of people do have success, I just don't. So cards that are in this type of tier that can still be effective are, Premium Westbrook is definitely one of them in Prime Series 2. Russell Westbrook is probably the one you see most commonly. You see a bunch of Westbrooks. Another one is, I think it's Flash 4, John Wall. John Wall, you can you see a lot of. You see a lot of De'Aaron Fox, who is a buzzer beater card, I think. I keep forgetting what card is in what. You see a lot of De'Aaron Foxes as well that play this role perfectly. You see even someone like 
what I ran right there, uh, Jay Williams. And then none of these. Even if you're looking at some spotlights in moments cards that play this kind of role. You've got Jamarant, that's really it. Lance Stevenson to an extent, but I think Lance Stevenson's more of a peekaboo jump shooter. But he can play that role as well. But they're the type of cards you're looking at if you want a kind of undersized slasher to just dunk on people. These these cards are kind of the best of both worlds. Like they can go to the basket, they can shoot a little bit, and they're not as high degree of difficulty to use as someone like a peekaboo jump shooter, but they're still usable. Then also the most commonly used one is the giant. So we've got Isaac Bonga here. And the reason why I have Isaac Bonga in is literally because he can match up with players. So you've got the giants and the counters. So you've got some counters that I like to use, like Michael Ray Richardson, who is a really elite interior defender as well as perimeter defender, six foot five point guard. You've got Bonga, who's a six foot eight point guard with limitless range, with clamps, with pretty much everything. And the reason for the giants is just because of 2K kind of abusing position locks. So with the giants, you have to deal with um, Giannis. Giannis is the best card in the game. I think he's the best card by a significant amount. Then you also have got Ben Simmons, who is just game breaking. Limitless range, Ben Simmons is crazy. Then you also have to worry about Magic Johnson, who can do the exact same thing as well. He's at a 500k. So what I would always suggest is to have Bonga somewhere in your collection. Like Isaac Bonga right now is, like he's ending at around 6,000. Like he's anything under 30,000, Bonga's a, much, a must, must buy for everybody. Like he is straight up a card that you need to buy in my team. Um, he's kind of the first must-buy player that I'm going to suggest. But uh, yeah, so these are the two different. These are the different types of point guards. So there is honestly so much choice when it comes to the point guard position that you can do a little bit of everything. Just know your play style and know what player suit the play style. So the two and the three, basically, you just need want the same things from these positions. So at the two and the three, you just need key badges more than anything, because a lot of the time you will be running through your point guard. And we're looking at key badges. Also, sorry, key badges for your point guard, which I'm going to talk about right now, is you need clamps, at least gold or Hall of Fame. You need clamps. You need quick first step, gold or Hall of Fame. Dimer's not that big a deal. You need tight handles. Handles for days helps, but you need tight handles. Um, unpluckable is a nice badge to have, but it's it actually, yeah, unpluckable is definitely a nice badge to have. You need pick dodger, at least gold. You need quick draw and range extender at least gold. So they're the type, they're the badges that you need. Any like gold or above is fine. And that's really what you need. And three point shot, like if you have those badges, their stats, any card with all those badges, their stats are good enough to use. The badges are more important than stats. The two guard and the three, you need basically the same thing. So what you need is a guy who can shoot the ball as well as play defense and dribble if you don't run through your point guard. So for me anyway, I use Brandon Roy. But there are so, so many alternatives. Like you can hold your own with Dan Marley. You can hold your own with Dan Marley because Dan Marley is all the key badges. He doesn't have quick first step, which is not as key for, for Dugard. He's got Hall of Fame pick dodger, Hall of Fame clamps, Hall of Fame range extender, Hall of Fame quick draw. So like he's got all the key badges Hall of Fame. So that's why that's why I'm looking at this card as a really good option. Obviously, Brandon Roy is really good. Um, Lance Stevenson's another good budget option because he, again, he has all the key badges you want, at least gold. Means again, it is all about key badges, not about badges in general. But one player I would say is a kind of must pick up because he's free. I say, if you want to have success in my team and you're really struggling, grind the two hours on Cam Reddish. Trust me, grind those two hours. So Cam Reddish is basically a perfect card. What I used to call him the perfect wings was cards with quick first step, range extender, um, quick draw and clamps. And that's what Cam Reddish has. So Cam Reddish has got range extender, he's got stop and go, quick free step Hall of Fame, clamps Hall of Fame, Intimidator Hall of Fame, and a bunch of great gold badges. Got gold quick draw as well. So you kind of need quick draw, but every card is quick draw at this stage. And again, like he's normally, like not normally, all the time the cards have the badges, the stats will follow. So Cam Reddish is a perfect player to use. And then and other players like this, if you guys are on an extreme budget, I would advise you to go for a Dan Marley type player maybe a Lance Stevenson, or if you do have that little bit extra time on your hands, because let's be real, most of us are in quarantine right now, so um, Kevin Porter Jr. is a really good option. He's kind of like a slightly worse Cam Reddish, and again, is free from the Spotlight Sim Challenges. And again, if you want to win the Spotlight Sim Challenges, I have an entire tutorial on that on the channel. It is very, very easy to do. If you're 
uh, for the spotlight sim challenges literally the only playbook you need is the brooklyn nets playbook and there's a play where you can get a layup every single time small forward is literally the exact same and um, budget options that you can use and get away with are probably not really any small forwards like you can obviously use reddish and kevin porter and i might just go two guards budget options you can hold your own with are dan marley and you can also definitely hold your own with lance stevenson two of these guys are quite cheap and you can definitely like these guys the one two and three you'll be able to hold your own against most people like yeah if you're playing it's a better player with a better team you're gonna struggle but you'll be able to hold your own so the power forward is a little bit play style so the players that i like to use are basically small forwards at power forward just for speed and i think an ideal one on a budget is a danny manning because danny manning has got a really great release he's got a really good post game post um hook of 95 post fade of 95 he has got 22 hall of fame badges he's got um he's got deep hooks quick first step he's got gold clamps gold range extender gold quick draw gold intimidator a little bit not great rebounder but again he's really cheap so he can get away with him and he's also 6'10". So other players you can get away with. I think range extender is a must on a power forward. Means if you end up five outing and he steps too far out, you need to shoot the ball. But if you don't, certain people can get away without range extender using someone like an Isaac. And um, players that I like running here, I like running Rocco, who like the reason I'm suggesting him is because he's free from the spotlight sim challenges. And when you go to Amethyst and lower, there's not many great ones. Jeff Green is a pretty good one. He can attack the basket and score with the best of them. But I think for the price, for like the 6, 7k he's going for, Sharif Abdurrahim is perfect type of player to use. And for the wings like this, honestly, I don't think you can use Kevin Durant, you can use LeBron. You guys all know who you can use on the wings. Um, but I don't think any of the wings are that much of an upgrade. Like T-Mac and Brandon Roy, um, depending on your uh, type of play style, are probably the two best players to use at the two or maybe Jamal Crawford. They're probably the best players to use there. But that's for my play style, but all, it all depends on your play style. But Reddish can hold his own. Porter can hold his own. So if you guys are new to the game, you can run with them. Or if you guys have unlimited MT, you can run with... To be fair, if you have unlimited MT, you can run with pretty much anyone in the game. Like, if you have unlimited MT, just go to position, two guard, color, opal. And... I wouldn't necessarily run with Vince Carter or Jordan or Iverson, but you can run with Jamal Crawford. Wouldn't run with Mitchell. You can run with T Mac. They're probably the only two Opals, and then Brandon Roy is really good. So they're the type of players that I would run at the two. But um, yeah, nearly all the good two, um, two and threes would be kind of power forwards. So at the three as well, you can run with a couple of Ricci power forwards. And um, Paul Pierce is pretty good. Gerald Wallace, Rihachi Mora. So these guys are all pretty good. So, then we are going to go on to the center position, and this is where you have the most choice. So, uh, just like the point, just like the uh, point guards, I think there is three different types of centers. So, luckily enough, I have options for all of them. So, we have got the three-point shooting centers. So, those type of centers are on a budget. The best one you're going to get is um, Thon Maker. However, when you guys are actually looking. Um, on the auction house if you want like those pick and pop limitless range centers honestly the, the ones that the ones that you see people using mostly are like ilgauskas even though i don't think ilgauskas is that great i know he's 30k i don't think he's that great if i was to say who the best of those would be i would probably say it's harry giles like harry giles if you want your center shoot from limitless harry giles is a guy who seems to have gone up a lot in price he was 20k yesterday and he seems to be up at 40k which is a completely fair price for Harry Giles, 30k. But Harry Giles basically is a super quick 6'11 big man with Hall of Fame range extender, Hall of Fame quick draw, a really good release, as well as a pretty good defender. So if you want a pick and pop jump shooter, he's there. Other cards that people do like to use are Bam out of Bio, who I still think is a little bit overpriced for what he is. As well as Bam out of Bio, people are out here running with another really, really overpriced card. And... It's the Frostbite Anthony Davis that some people still really like. I don't rate these cards that highly. And I think that this type of center has kind of been, he's kind of been like almost obliterated by just better players. And then there is another type of center, which is the Giants. So 
Like obviously you can use Taco or you can use Manute Bowl, but if you're on a budget, the best giant is either, if you have the money to get Boban, if not, you're gonna see a lot of Mirasan still. Mirasan's a little bit out of class nowadays, but start of the year he was the best guy in the game. If you're just starting out, you could definitely be able to do a little bit of damage with him. But I think in terms of just affordability, Boban might be the best of the Giants. And then there is kind of two more centers to use. I'm gonna talk about these guys as exceptions to the rule of end. Like these are exceptions to my rules, these two specific cards, but I'm not gonna put them in my centers because there is only two specific cards. And I'm pretty sure if you guys have one of those cards, you're not gonna be watching this video. Um, we're now onto the super speed centers. So those type of centers are, they're almost like point centers. To an extent, Thon Maker is that type of card, but I do think of more as a shooter in a point center. But these super speed point center centers, um, I'm gonna talk about these now. And the first one is Marvin Bagley. So Marv, if you're on an extreme budget, Marvin Bagley is the player you should look for. He's got a whole thing quick first step. He's actually a good shooter, great defender, can do a little bit of everything. If you're mid tier, this type of, this is the guy you should be looking at, Dino Raja. Now Dino Raja is absolutely class. Like he's a mixture between Yanis and Kevin McHale. 33 Hall of Fames, really good shooter, super, super quick and speed boost lead behind the back and has the max wingspan and if you are good enough will chamberlain fits this role perfectly another player that fits the role is probably the best auctionable center and it is where is he carl or kareem abdul jabbar what's he he's buzzer beater isn't he yeah so kareem is probably the best of the auctionable ones that you can use right here he's about four or five hundred k though and he's just only a little bit better than will chamberlain in my opinion and then other cards that I forgot that you can lock in, in terms of like pick and pop, pick and pop limitless shooters, Carl Anthony Towns goes in there, who was the lock in for the Campus Legends set, but it's just a little bit overpriced because Mello is, like I think Mello is just kind of a, just another guy in the game, in terms of running with small forwards, like not that much better than Reddish and a half a million. And like I wouldn't pay over one and a half million for this set to be completely honest. And then other cards, like if you want Ralph Sampson, he goes into the Giants category, you've got I don't even know where Greg Oden, he fits somewhere in between. I think he's kind of in the speed center category, but not great. And yeah, that's kind of the main things for the center position. However, there is two cards that is an exception, and these guys are a power forward or center. Depending on what way you play, just if you have these cards, they're unbelievable. And there are two new cards that were released. So the first one is Kristaps. So Kristaps is about 300K, but Kristaps is a demigod. like. It's kind, of, it's kind of hard to put him in a tier because I can talk about the other players, what their strengths and weaknesses are, how they play. Kristaps is just a straight up demigod. So Kristaps and Bol Bol, the two of these cards are the exact same. There's a reason why they're so expensive, but these guys are weak centers that can that are ultra long, can handle the ball, can shoot from deep. So I do prefer both these guys to power forward position, but you can use them in power forward, you can use them in center. They're just the demigods. There's no other way to describe it. So yeah, that is it for the team building section of the video now we are going to go on to jd's um and energetics parts where we're talking about build or we're talking about getting the mt together to make these type of squads and then we're going to get on to the actual gameplay parts yo what's going on guys it is jd here and in this little segment that dbg has kindly given to me i'm going to be teaching you guys about investing so if you guys don't know me or my channel, we just hit 10,000 subscribers and my No Money Spent account is arguably one of the best out there this year. We are 255 episodes deep and uh, yeah, as you can see, we're 1.6 million in the top right hand corner. This is my main squad. Um, so obviously I've done pretty well for myself this year. If we sold off everything, I'll probably be about 3 to 4 million MT. So that's enough bragging out of the way. How much of that did I actually make from investing? I'm going to say probably like 1 to 2 million MT we've made this year through investing and there's a couple of tips and tricks I'm going to give you guys in this video so the first one I'm going to say is to always look out for locker codes and more specifically look out for the players that come out in locker codes because when locker codes come out even if it's not a guaranteed player even if it's uh, you know you get packs or a player players come down in price massively so one that springs to mind from the last couple of sets was this diamond Paul Pierce now when he came out in the locker code he was down at like five, 6,000 MT, and you can see already his price has rebounded up. And that is the same for every card that comes out in a locker code without fail. I'm not joking, without fail, every card that comes out in a locker code will rebound up in price. And it's the same with consumables as well. So if you're picking Paul Pierce up for about 6,000 MT, even now you'd be able to make about 4,000 MT profit on each card. And let's not forget the code only came out a couple of weeks ago. So the longer the code, or the longer time difference there is, the more their price is gonna rise. So locker codes and players 
is definitely a good thing to look out for. Next up, I will say about market crashes. Now, this year, I have made some massive, massive plays during market crashes. So I managed to pick up a pink diamond Giannis uh, a couple of weeks back when it was a big market crash. I can't remember which one it was because there's so many this year. I picked him up for 120K, sold him off for 260K, literally like a day or two later. I picked up a LeBron James pink diamond card for 200K, sold him off for 400K, made ridiculous amounts of profit right there. Uh, and the same can be said for uh, consumables and contracts and stuff like that. So earlier on in the year, I made some big, big profit off of diamond three-point shoes. Now, it's all about knowing which shoes have the most value. And of course, three-point shoes, like the Kobe 9s right here, or 11, sorry, any three-point shoe is always going to have a significant amount of value. And at some point in the year, I think it was around Christmas time, they went down to about 20,000 MT per shoe. So I held on to them, and then before you knew it, they were up at 40,000 MT, and I was very happy to cash out on that. Next up, it is going to be when new sets come out, it is a very good idea to invest in the cheap but the usable cards in the set. So at the moment on my account, I have invested in Danny Manning's, Dante DiVincenzo's, and Eric Pascal's. Now, these are what I'd call low risk and high, well, higher risk, sort of mid-tier risk reward uh, rewards investments. So Dante DiVincenzo and Eric Pascal were very, very low risk because Eric Pascal discards for 1,000 MT. I was buying him for 1,100 MT. At the moment, he's still selling for about the same. So not any profit on him just yet. And the same situation for Dante DiVincenzo. Discards for 800. So even if you don't get any profit on these guys, you're going to be able to discard them for the same amount, basically, that you paid for them, which is great. And then Danny Manning at the moment is a card that I've invested in. Like I said, he is a mid-tier investment because I did spend 6,000 MT per card on him. And that was when he was impact. So when there was the most of him on the auction house and as we can see at the moment his price has now come up a little bit i believe to around the 8000 mt mark so instantly we've got profit on all of these cards sitting here and it's all about knowing when to sell as well so you want to you don't want to be too greedy because there's always going to be new cards that come out so there could be another set that comes out in the next couple of days that has another diamond small forward or power forward that is very similar to danny manning and just kind of depre depreciates his value so i'm going to wait until he hits about 10,000 mt and then i am going to cash out on him and in terms of the best times of day to sell, the best time of day to sell cards is going to be in the evenings and the best time to buy cards is in the mornings. And that is for me, in uh, obviously in England, so on GMT, European time, but there is only one auction house. So the reason I'd say to go for cheap cards like these sets right here is because I've had a lot of success doing so in the year. So out of this set right here, we actually invested in all three of these guys, Steve Nash, Chauncey Billups, and Big uh, Shaq as well. So Shaq, we were buying for discard value, 1,000 MT again. And again, that was because he was in a locker code that came out as well. Sold him off for about 4,000 MT, so made 3,000 MT per card on him. Chauncey Billups actually bought him for about 3,000 MT, very similar to Shaq and went ahead and sold him off for 8,000 MT, I believe. And then Steve Nash bought for about 12K, sold off for about 18K. So very, very good profit on him as well. So it's all about knowing the good players. So someone like Jalil Okafor, not a good card, never going to rise in value. So I would not recommend going in him. But Eric Pascal is a very good card. Danny Manning, of course, a fantastic card. And DiVincenzo, a very, very good budget card as well. So in terms of the times, you're going to have to wait. So these Campus Legend cards only went out of packs, I think, two days ago, as you guys are watching this. So you're going to have to wait a couple of weeks. Like, investing is a long game. You're not going to get profit overnight, apart from when it is a market crash. When it's a market crash, you want to be... So like the Taco Full set that came out, the uh, fan favorites right here with the Bowl Bowl, when this was first announced, everything crashed so hard you could pick up like galaxy for ben simmons for like 400k and straight away he's back up at like 600k so market crashes can make you the most mt very quickly but you have to have a lot of mt spare to actually be able to buy the cards in the first place so that is a little crash course on investing be sure to come over to my channel if you want to see any more episodes like i said i've got 255 of this account so far uh, and it's obviously like i said one of the best out there but yeah enjoy the rest of the video yo what's going on youtube energetic here so basically i'm here to explain to you about sniping and what sniping is and how you can make MT off of sniping. So I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of how you can snipe and just what to look out for when you want to snipe and just like the best things that you can do. So I actually make a lot of sniping videos on my channel. So if you want to check it out, you know, definitely I'd appreciate it. You know, I make a lot of sniping tips videos. People say they're very helpful. But yeah, we're going to get into this and I'm going to show you exactly what you want to look out for so i'm going to give you an example right so this pink diamond brandon roy that recently came out today he's actually pretty expensive but he's he is a buy now but he's one of the more expensive ones so this pink diamond brandon roy is going for ninety six thousand, basically ninety seven thousand mt an example of a snipe would be if you got this brandon roy for significantly cheaper than ninety seven thousand. so i would say anything under ninety thousand is a good price to get for brandon roy 
but you're not gonna make huge profit if you were to get them for 90,000. Let's say you sniped them for 90,000 and you sold them at 97,000. That's a little 7,000 MT profit besides minus the 10% tax, right? But basically for the most part, you wanna try to get them for underneath that. You wanna try to get them for as low as a price as you can. So let's say I wanted to snipe this Brandon Roy specifically. I would probably put my max buyout to around 90,000. And then anything under 90,000 that somebody does end up putting up on the auction house will pop up. So we go 90,000 on the max buyout right here. And then we would just put the max bid to 100K. We take off the, the minimum buyout. You don't have to, but there's no purpose in having it there. Then you can just put the max bid to 100K. And then you got Paint Diamond, Brandon Roy. And then, yeah, basically this is an example of how you can snipe a card, a specific card. So what do you do is the reason you put the maximum bid to 100K is because you need something to refresh the filter. So if you don't have anything that's adjusting the filter here, then it's never gonna update. The auction house will never update. That's how it refreshes when you have something else, right? To refresh the filter. When you're, when you're changing something within the filter, that's how it refreshes. So if I wanted to snipe Brandon Roy, I would spend a decent amount of time on this filter and I can get myself a Brandon Roy. I would spend a good amount of time because snipes, they're not so frequent. You need to be patient, you need to be consistent, and then you can get yourself a snipe. But there are tons of players you can snipe. So let's say you wanted to snipe a Galaxy Opal card. And none of the Galaxy Opal cards are buy nows. So you can actually snipe any one of these with the Galaxy Opal filter. Now, some of them go for more profit than others. Like this Allen Iverson doesn't give you much profit if you do snipe him. But if you do want to snipe Galaxy Opals, literally all you have to do is go Galaxy Opal and go minimum buyout 500 because none of them go for buy nows. So you use this and you keep increasing the, buy, the minimum buyout. And then if you see something pop up, you try to get it as fast as you can. And if you do get it, you can either keep it or you can sell it for profit. Also, I highly recommend when sniping to always have at least 100,000 MT to snipe with because at that point, you can snipe Galaxy Opals, okay? So, for the most part, if you're trying to snipe Galaxy Opals, they usually go up for 100K exactly, but sometimes they can go for less. Like, some people throw up snipes that are Galaxy Opal for 50,000 MT, for 80,000 MT, it really just depends. But for the most part, most snipes are 100,000 MT. That's why I always suggest having 100,000 MT to sit on so you can actually snipe opals because those are going to get you the biggest profit out of anything else all right so try to always have 100k mt and if you don't have 100k mt you can use budget snipe filters to get to 100k mt and then at that point you can just keep stacking it and stacking it and stacking it and then you'll just become a beast at sniping you know you'll be able to snipe cards fairly easily without too much you know trouble and then you'll you'll be okay and then you're gonna be making a lot of MT and then you could really build a really good team without spending money, which is what I've been able to accomplish. And it actually is great because they don't, you don't wanna spend money on packs. They're not worth it when you can just go out and snipe the players instead. And if you're not sniping the players that you need, you're sniping other players for MT and then you buy the players that you need with the MT that you get off the snipes. And then at that point, you can just get whoever you want for your team. And that's what I do to get all my MT. That's how I built a great team without spending any money. Just straight sniping players for profit and keeping some of them the ones that I actually like. So yeah, that's basically the basics of it. If you really want to learn more about it, you can check out my filter videos on my channel. I do tons of filter videos like every week. And you know, on, on my stream, I talk about sniping too. And just different kinds of filters you can use. There's also budget filters for people who don't have much MT. But I don't want to go too in depth right here. If you want to see how to snipe without much MT, you can definitely check out my channel and I can help you out with that. So now we are going to be moving on to the gameplay part of this video. So I'm gonna be going over some very, very basic things you can do in my team. I'm gonna be going over the peekaboo dribble move, which I think having that in your arsenal makes you significantly more dangerous as a player, makes you an awful lot more difficult to defend. And also I'll be going very, very quickly over what is the most overpowered shot in the game this year. And yeah. We are now going to get onto my part and obviously Bio's part. So now we're going to go over some just very, very basic dribble moves because honestly, if you guys know my videos, you know I'm not a great dribbler, but being able to shoot out of these is important. So before you guys say anything, meter on, meter off is an actual genuine question. So you can use meter on, meter off. I honestly think it's preference. For me personally, I play better with the meter on, but like, like there's no reason why like there's certain games where I have turned the meter off and have had a lot of success. I definitely prefer the meter on. I'm more comfortable with it, but I can 100% shoot and get away with meter off. 
The reason why most of the top players in the game you see running with the meter off nowadays is because while it gives you a, it does give you a tiny, tiny advantage turning the meter off, they just use the meter off all year. So they're used to um, not playing with the meter. So um, for me, someone who didn't turn my meter off earlier in the year, um, I just much prefer using the meter on the meter off. It is definitely a little bit of a downside at times, but for me, I prefer using the meter. I've played with both. I've tried turning the meter off and I can't shoot that well. And I still shoot shoot as many greens as the best of them, to be honest. And either way, with the way all players have 99 rating and there's so much RNG based, I don't think it makes much of a difference anymore. So now we're gonna be talking about certain things on the dribble. So especially if you have an unpluckable player, holding L2 is important. So I'm holding L2, I'm not holding L2, and you can see how I'm wide, I'm just here out in the open with every dribble move. And all that takes, especially with a player without unpluckable, is one square press and that ball is stolen. You need to hold L2 so that you're using your body to stop players getting it. They will still steal the ball, but it drastically lowers the chance. So coming off screens, especially, make sure that you have your player in this position right here, because if, they were, if they're where they were the last time, if they're, let's see if I can cross. There we go. If they're facing that way, it's gonna be a lot slower to come off that screen. So just make sure they are facing towards um, the opposite sideline. So off this, it's very, very important um, to come off this screen and to learn the peekaboo. So you see what I did right there, which was a snatchback. So the snatchback animation of that is too slow. Like that is def just that little bit too slow. What you want to do is, is you see this while the dribble move is happening. So while the ball is coming across, hit the square button into the shot while that's happening. So as you guys can see here, he didn't like he didn't do a dribble move. It was an instant stop off a sprint. So a quick first step sprint into an insta stop into a green. That is what the peekaboo is. So what you need to do is flick down the stick and as the drill move is happening, super quickly press the square button. It is a really easy way to do it and it's literally just flicking the analog stick down. So flicking it down causes a behind the back dribble, but there is a glitch while in that animation, that wasn't right there, you can press that square button to make an instant stop. There is another way of doing this and it's um, tapping L2. So if you are going to the basket and you tap L2, you insta stop. I personally think the peekaboo is faster. Uh, the L2 is almost a quick stop as well, but these are the two things you will need to master if you are going to become a good shooter off the dribble. Because that is one of the most important things in the game for everybody, is the ability to shoot off screens. And otherwise, you're gonna be out here shooting slow stop where the defender gets there, or you're gonna be out here shooting moving threes, which are some, of the low, are some low percentage shots. This isn't 2K19 anymore. You cannot be out here taking leaners and win games. This is not 2K19, so you gotta be able to quick stop. And for me anyway, I think the peekaboo is the quickest stop, uh, or you can go in L2. You gotta have everything in your arsenal to stop, and you ha gotta have everything in your arsenal. You also have gotta just um, be able to hesitate, be able to read what the defender is throwing at you, because the peekaboo does not always guarantee a um, shot if they're placing them too high. You gotta be able to read when it's happening and go by them. The peekaboo will get you to shot more often. It will make everything quicker. It does not guarantee anything. It's still all about your reads, but this will help you get those open shots way, way more often in game. And now I'm gonna talk about the most overpowered offensive thing in the game. And I'm telling you, this cannot be your plan A, B, and C. This should be your plan B or C. Dump the ball in the post and take post hooks. I am telling you, post hooks are, have been broken since day one in this game with Mirasan. Post hooks are some of the most overpowered things in the game. There's a reason why I've tried to popularize the phrase death by a thousand post hooks, because that is a legitimate tactic of winning in this game. Post hooks with 80% contest still go in at a high rate. I'm, I genuinely think I miss more post hooks in shoot around than I do in games. Like post hooks, that animation is terrible, but post hooks are almost unstoppable. If you're good with your players, if you've got a good release, they are almost unstoppable, especially, especially if you go out with a giant. So if I went out there with Taco Fall, or if I went out there with Boban Marjanovic, it would be so difficult to stop. Literally, if you have a center that's under seven foot tall, Taco Fall is bullying them and getting to this position and hitting a hook every single time. Like you genuinely miss more hook shots in shoot around than you do in games. Like that shot, it goes in with a pretty much 100% certainty in, um, in games. It is ridiculous. And to shoot a hook shot, you flick up on the analog stick. That animation right there is the worst animation in the game because it basically stops the hook shot. But once you get into that hook shot animation, by flicking up the right stick, you are going to score almost every time. However, if the other team times it properly, if um, 
they have a guy that's equal size and they know what they're doing, the post hook might be not the greatest. If the other team's doubling down, and the other team will be able to stop the post hook. So the thing is, you gotta have it as a plan, either a plan B or C, or you've gotta be able to read when the post hook's on, when the post hook isn't, and kick the shooters. But it is a seriously, seriously overpowered tactic. And the reason why when things break down, I will dump the ball into Taco for a few easy points. Because it should not be your plan A, B, and C, but it can be a very, very effective way of playing this game. Especially if you are one of those players that decides to use a giant as one of your centers. Or heck, it doesn't even matter. Like, I was out here post-hooking people with Isaac Bonga's 40 rating a couple of days ago. Um, it really does not matter what their height is. Like, you can play bully ball and you can be out there and shooting post-hooks. It really doesn't matter. As long as you have a height advantage at your position. So if they do have a six-foot-tall point guard on Bonga, Bonga will still kill them by post-hooks. So as long as you have a height advantage, the post-hook game is going to be on and it's going to be OP. And the crazy thing is that I genuinely think that you miss more post hooks and shoot around the new games. It is scary how often post hooks go in. So that is it for my mini gameplay type tutorial, going over some of the very, very basics in terms of getting some scores. Obviously, there is a lot more depth that I could probably go into. However, I'm going to leave that for Bio, who is going to be up next. What is going on, guys? It is your boy, Bio2K. And in this video, I'm going to be giving you guys a short little breakdown on like the top three or four best playbooks in this game. Now, online, there are three of them that are really good and definitely going to help you guys out and win some more games. The 2013 Miami Heat playbook is one of the best ones that you guys can have. And also, the Charlotte Hornets current playbook are the two best playbooks that you guys can use for three-point plays and stuff like that. I do give the edge to the 13 Miami Heat playbook just a little bit more because it does have some of the more cheesier plays that have been really good for Unlimited in the past like two years. Um, so yeah, I do like that playbook, but like I said, the Hornets playbook is just as good. I'm gonna get into a game or I'm gonna get into a few games and show you guys like the best plays from those. Um, other than that though, another good, really good playbook for you guys is the Bucks current playbook as well. That is more for the five out game, which I will show you guys again, a quick little breakdown of that about why the Bucks playbook is so good for five outing and stuff like that. Um, offline purposes though, I will be showing you guys um, a short little thing as well based on the Nets playbook. Um, you guys know I've covered this in a lot of my spotlight videos and a lot of like offline challenge videos, especially the spotlight sim ones. Um, where the Nets playbook just basically like you could beat them with a full bronze team because there's a play in it that basically lets you score every single time. Make sure that you guys have your play vision display set to full. It's going to be found in the coaching settings. Um, it just kind of helps you guys out with um, just knowing how the plays run and stuff like that. I'm going to set up the plays for you guys here um, and just kind of show you guys the best one. So quick four horns flare is going to be number one. Then we're going to have punch five flare rip. We're going to have quick 32 box flare and then we are going to have uh, quick three rip floppy. Those are the four best plays in the Miami Heat 13 playbook. When you guys are in the game, you're going to hit L1 if you're on PS4 or LB if you're on Xbox to pull up your plays and then simply just click whatever play you want. Now, this first play you guys will see is one of the most familiar ones in 2K. Um, a lot of like my team YouTubers and streamers will run this play. Um, it's basically something that's been in the game since 2K18 and it is one of the most efficient plays at getting wide open. We're going to just go ahead and let them score here so they just hurry up and shoot the ball. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, we're going to go ahead and just run the same play again. Just one more time just to kind of show you guys like how well it does work. So we'll run it with Dr. J now. We're going to do this. And Larry Bird gets wide open. The next play is Punch 5 Flare Rip. Again, very common with um, YouTubers and streamers that do like using this play. It is very good for getting somebody a wide open three without your opponent really even realizing what's happening. Same thing again. We're going to run the play one more time just to kind of show you guys, you know, how well it does work. We're gonna pump fake it and we're gonna get Brandon Roy wide open for another easy three. Then the next play is quick 32 box flare. Again, one of my more favorite plays because you guys will see again, it gets somebody wide open. The only real problem that you will run into with this play is the fact that there's like no floor spacing in this game. Same thing, we're gonna run the play, but what I mean by that is the fact that, you know, you guys will see when Brandon Roy does come up here um, and we do pass that ball. Tony Parker, like the spot that it does start to play is very close to where you already are. So you guys can see he did get a 64% contest on that. So sometimes, you know, that play is a little bit hit or miss when you're playing online. Just judging off of where, you know, your, um, <clears throat> your point guard is standing or wherever, you know, he may be or whoever. I will run it one more time though, just because that wasn't really a good look. So sometimes when I do run this play though, I will kind of hedge down a little bit more here to kind of get this open look. But also you guys will see Dr. J comes around that screen or your small forward comes around that screen and you do get like kind of like a secondary look that does like help you score pretty efficiently as well. 
Now the final play is quick three rip floppy. I'm not really the biggest fan of this play because you guys will see it does take a little bit for the play to actually develop for some reason. But if it does work, you guys do get a wide open three. So that's really like the plus side to it. But like I said, the only downside is it does take very long. So your opponent will probably catch on and know what you're doing while you're trying to set up the play. So I'm not really like the biggest fan on it. I would recommend running the other ones before running this one. But it does still work out in the long run. So it's not like it's like a bad play. It definitely is still top four in my opinion. But... So with the Hornets playbook here, what we're going to be covering is quick two chest flare, fist one weave high, and punch five quick two. The quick two chest flare, the reason why I like this play a lot is because you guys will see Brandon Roy is going to cut in, but then immediately come back out, and then Harden is going to actually get stuck on a screen. I mistimed that release right there. That was my fault. But the reason why I do like this play, like I said, is because when he cuts in, especially if you're playing online and you do run this play, like nine times out of ten, if your opponent's trying to like off ball you or whatever the case may be, he's going to try to like follow you. And when your guy cuts into the paint, he's going to back up and immediately get stuck on a screen and it's going to kind of help you out and give you a nice little wide open three so again same thing brandon roy is going to cut and immediately come back out and that time he got really wide open instead of you know barely wide open he was definitely wide open next play we're going to cover is punch five quick two i, I put them out of order i do like this play a lot more than the other one because you guys will see what's going to happen is you have some movement over here at tony parker boom wide open for a three i missed time that again that was my fault but you guys can see again you're getting a nice wide open three next play is going to be fist one weave high the reason why i like this play so much is because it does remind me of the warriors freelance from last year if you guys don't know what i'm talking about the warriors freelance from 2k19 was very cheesy in the sense that it actually your sides dropped down and then the two sides came up for wide open threes now the reason why that was so effective is because your opponent really had to pick what side you know they wanted to defend this one it really is just only one side but again your opponent's not really going to see it coming based on the fact of where the screen is being set where they're looking and stuff like that so you guys can see again it's consistent wide open threes with the bucks playbook here all you guys do need is two things one you just need to put in this play called fist 64 five out down and then for your freelance you just need to put in the hawks 2018 freelance very easy nothing really too too complicated behind it you're just going to click that and then you're going to go ahead and hit the five out play basically so what you're going to do is you're going to hit one swift move and then you're going to get either a wide open corner three or you will get a wide open layup now obviously i am going up against the computer so they do play it up a little bit differently but this is where you guys can run the pick and roll game and stuff like that and you guys will see you'll get easy wide open layups and stuff like that virtually all game the computer like i said does react to it a little bit differently but that's why i'm going to be showing you guys the nets playbook where you get a wide open layup literally every single time with the final playbook here, all you guys are going to need is this play called Quick Through STS. Like I said, I've covered this in almost every single Spotlight Challenge video, every single tip video that involved offline gameplay. It doesn't matter. Domination, whatever it may be. This, this play can literally, it'll be anything for you. So all you need to do is literally like put the play up like I did, and then you're going to click the play, and you guys will see right here. We're going to get a wide open layup with Tony Parker every single time. Now that one, of course... Now that I'm recording, wasn't that wide open. But I will show you guys again and again and again. You guys can go and watch any of those videos. Um, like I said, I did a 70-hour grind for the Spotlight Sim Challenges live on Twitch and basically used this play a decent amount. Not really, I didn't use it a lot, but I used it a decent amount. But it literally, like I said, it's, it's as simple as just getting a wide open layup literally every single time. You could spam this play over and over and over and over and over again. The only time they will help down is like really random, but when they do help down, you guys will see like you actually end up getting a wide open three anyway, and they don't rotate over or anything like that. So again, I will show you guys this play one more time. We'll even run it with Brandon Roy this time. Why not? So let's run over here. Again, they run the play. I always pump fake because it pulls in that extra defender and then you get a wide open dunk. All in all, though, like I said, the Miami Heat 13 playbook is the best playbook for online gameplay, and the Brooklyn Nets current playbook is the best playbook for offline gameplay, no matter what challenge it is. Like I said, domination, spotlights, whatever it may be, that is the best playbook for you. If you guys did enjoy and these tips did help you guys out, be sure to check out my channel, Bio2K up on YouTube or Bio2K underscore on Twitch. Um, yeah, obviously, you know what? Do me a favor, though. Leave a like for my boy DBG. Obviously, this man is a goat letting all of us do this for his video and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, be sure to show some love to my guy. And, uh, yeah. So, next up, we are going to be going on to a defensive section. And this is a video that was already posted. Um, I asked him if he, if he would give me a little bit of a hand. And he told me he was posting a video himself, but I have permission to show you guys here. So, this is from the Global Champion, also a 250K qualifier, seen as the best My Team player in the world by a lot of people. 
I'm probably the best defensive player in the world. This is a defense tutorial by Ty Debo. Today, we're going to be going over my defensive strategies, right? And just some things to look for on the defense event. Um, Cause a lot of you guys have been asking for that. Now I am probably in the community known for at least being a top three defensive my team player uh, in the community. And that's what I pride myself um, on the most. I want to be the best defensive player I can. Um, I want to get my rotations down. Uh, every every little aspect of defense is is, is something I focus on um, every single game. I feel like that's where I excel compared to um, some other my team uh, YouTubers, some streamers, um, and just some my team players in general. So today I am going to be going through um, a few defensive things to look for, um, how to defend uh, four out one in, um, pick and roll, um, certain things to look for on coverages, baiting wise, playing two with one. Um, and, and like how to rotate on an offensive rebound just all this stuff um, That you wouldn't necessarily think about but I will After this video, I'm gonna have you thinking about all the little things on the defensive end that before this video You wouldn't even have thought about before um, so without further ado. Let's hop right into it first things first here um, If you haven't checked out my defensive settings video go do that um, defensive settings video was posted a couple of weeks ago and that will make you a good that will that will be the start of making you an elite level defender on NBA 2K20 my team but going going um, through with some of them here on ball pressure is smother off ball pressure has to be tight these are the only settings in this menu that I will use coach settings has to be turned off this has to be 100% turned off and your coaching sliders help defense has to be all the way down it really does um, these things are the start to making you an elite level defender in NBA 2K20 my team all right so here's the basic look when you play defense against most people they're gonna be running the basic four out one and whether it's the Hawks freelance the point freelance this is what you're gonna see it's gonna be a ball handler usually at deep hash here KD is going to space out um, to deep hash here when he calls for the screen now I just wanted to show you what my typical defense is like against this type of offense. This is a pick and roll type offense. Okay. Now sometimes, sometimes in this scenario, right, I'm going to play a little bit. Sometimes you see AD, he's setting the screen. Okay. There's a lot of things going on here. Okay. First things first, I have my, I have my off ball pressure as tight. Okay. So as you can see, Rocco's tight, Reddish is tight, Bagley's tight. So nobody is going to get dotted from here. Okay. Sometimes in this scenario, I will bring, bring Rocco over as a second defender to stop Ben Simmons from going middle. I will use this a lot against guys that like to go middle and shoot off the screens. Okay. In that situation, he might dot it to KD, but I'm usually rotating with Cam Reddish. And I'll get, I'll get into that later in the video. On this situation, this is what I do the majority of the time. Okay. As he's using the screen. Jonathan Isaac's coming up to defend. Okay, so he cannot go middle in this situation where most people in my team unlimited want to go. They want to go middle, um, and so he goes. He tries going baseline, as you guys can see. Okay, he's got the slip for AD. So I rotate with Bagley, try to bait him to throw it corner. Okay, I try baiting him to throw a corner. As you guys can see, Isaac's out of the play. I ran a little bit too high with him, so I kind of got on a, in a three on two situation. Um, but in this situation, you got to give up the two. You can't get dotted in the corner for a three. He ends up throwing a lob for a dunk. Um, but that's just a, a, going over a brief summary of, of what to look for against a pick and roll type offense. And this is an example, guys. Look at his floor spacing. Look at his floor spacing. So when the screen gets here, he's got four guys on one side of the court. So you know where he wants to go. Because he does not want to go towards the side with multiple players. So you know where he's you know where he's going. He has one option. And so you see Melo. You see Melo, he thinks he's got an easy, easy opportunity to come off the screen, um, get to the rim, attack the paint, or even come off of it for a three. And Melo flies up, gets in the lane, and gets a bump steal. Okay, that, that's perfect. That's absolutely perfect because he has no other opportunity. He cannot split my he can't split the defense. He's coming off of it wide, and I know that Melo gets easy steal going the other way. That's that's basic um, pick and pop, pick and roll defense 101. As you guys see, this next question is the same thing. He's running a normal pick and roll. Um, he wants to go middle, I can tell. I hedge hard with D-Rob. As you guys see, he slipped it with Cat. Um, so my instinct is to switch to Rocco and rotate. Because um, he's going to, his first instinct is, wow, I got Cat wide open on the slip. Exactly what he thinks. You see me switch to Rocco. I don't know what his Kevin Durant's doing right now. Um, but I switched to Rocco. I kind of got glued onto Durant for a sec. And as you guys see, right now I'm playing two with one. 
no matter where he goes, if he throws a pass right now and I click square, it's a steal, 100%. You guys three see he's throwing the ball to Cat, instant steal. Um, and that's just, that's, a lot of it's just Roco playing defense. I'll play in, in full speed here. Just a nice quick reaction for an easy steal um, going the other way. Okay, so this is what most people who, who play the game think. They think, okay, he's hedging hard. If I slip it, I'm going to be able to dot the corner. That's their initial thought after I intercept it on, on the slip the first time. That's their initial thought. Um, and this has, this happens so much. When you, when you rotate once, they're going to assume you're going to do it again. And it, it's an easy steal the next time. Okay, so as you guys see, same situation. Calls for a pick and roll. I switch to D-Rob. Hedge hard. He has nowhere. He can't go middle anymore because D-Rob's there. He has one thing, the same thing. It's Carl on the roll. I switch to Rocco. He sees Rocco coming off the corner. Okay, he's like, oh, man, I got a dot here, right? He's like, look at KD. Nope. You know what I'm saying? Nope. Because I bait that. Okay, it's the same situation. He thinks I'm going over to take the roll. That's what I did the previous time down the court. And yet I stay home for an easy steal. It's just thinking one, it's, it's literally just thinking two steps ahead, right? Because he's thinking one step ahead on what happened the possession before, thinking he's going to be able to dot me, and, and he can't because of my instincts. On this next possession, I am going to talk about one of the biggest flaws in NBA 2K20. It's being able as a defensive player to make the offensive player's guys cut. Because as an offensive player, you cannot control all five guys. As you guys see, same situation. Basically a five-out pick and roll. Basically is what it is. It's four out one in, but cat comes and sets the screen. I switch to reddish. I don't want I don't like anybody going middle on me. So I come and pinch hard. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna switch to Roco and rotate. Because that will, that's where we're getting to next. But I don't have to worry about it as T Mac cuts and makes it easy on me. He sees Roco rotate. He tries dot in the corner. Easy steal. On this possession, I'm going to do the same thing as the last possession. This is one of my favorite things to do on the pick and roll. If I don't hedge hard, hedge hard with D-Rob, I am coming from the opposite wing. So I switch to Isaac. I know he wants to go middle. I, I'm, I'm making sure he doesn't go middle. He sees Isaac coming. What's his first instinct? It's to throw it to AD. That's, that's their first instinct. But it, it, unless you got openness on, it takes a little processing. Even if it's a 0.3 second reaction time, that's all it takes for Roko to rot rotate up. And that to be a baited pass for an easy steal going the other way. Like I said, it's the same thing. AD didn't necessarily cut there, but as you guys see, as you guys saw, he still drifted down to the corner a little bit. But even if he remains at the hash, that's still going to be a steal nine times out of ten. It's a simple rotation that is very, very effective. Okay, this is gonna be the same thing. Okay, I bring Worthy over. Some this isn't that great of a, an example, but it's a pretty good example. Okay, he sees Dr. J rotated. And usually I get more extreme. I, I commit hard and, and then I'm still able to bait this pass. But as you guys can see, he's already probably tapping X to pass it to D-Wade in the corner. He probably is already doing it as he sees me rotating with Julius. And it's an easy bait. Okay, because it's the pass our animation is already set off at this point. And it's like I said, it's just a, it's a, it's a natural reaction to make that one more. And it's an easy steal for Dr. J because on the last time I rotated all the way up and took that took that pass. So he thought I was going to do the same. Um, he thought I was going to rotate all the way up. But in this example, I bait one more. Like I said, it's always about th thinking one step ahead of the game. Um, that, that's really all that all it's about. All right. Here is an example. OK, he obviously has it. He has me beat here. OK, Ben Simmons has a wide open lane. So it's, it's a two on one right here with Dr. J, Ben Simmons and Dwayne Wade in the corner. Okay, so I want to show I, what I'm doing is showing, and this is this goes back to 2K's. I don't know what it is, but people cut all the time. Dwayne Wade cuts. I'm playing in between. If he if he throws any pass, it's a steal. He knows that. He keeps driving. Any pass is a steal. He like, like I'm saying. He got, what is he gonna do here? What is he gonna do? He over dribbles. Dr. J gets the pinch, and we're going the other way. Okay, it's a simple thing. Playing two with one. Um, don't over commit. Don't not commit. Kind of play in between. Think two steps ahead of your opponent. This next thing I'm going to talk about is just a small detail that I learned really this year. Um, and it's 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 a simple thing, um, but it, it's just it, you got to train your mind to do it every time. Um, so without how hard I hedge uh, screens, I give up a lot of offensive rebounds. You guys see me rotating with Cub. He has nowhere to go with the ball. He really doesn't. He shoots that. Um, you guys you guys know what's happening. 80 80s getting the rebound. Okay, so you guys got to think. 
Where is he going with the ball right now? Who is open? Because once they get the rebound, usually they want to kick out for an immediate three. If I was him, I would be thinking Ben Simmons. So that's who I switched on to. Switched on to Magic. He got a bad rebound and bad pass animation, which leads to an easy steal. It's just a simple thing. Sometimes you have to rotate for those types of steals on offensive rebounds. And sometimes they'll throw the most obvious pass right to you. Just the little things can give you, make you an, or give you an extra possession in a close game here or there. All right, this next thing that I'm going to talk about is if, if you go up against the Magic, Giannis, Ben Simmons, um, they each have their own thing. Magic Johnson has a glitchy behind the back. Ben Simmons got a glitchy between the legs. And Giannis has a glitchy behind the back. Now, one thing, it is very tough. It is very... It is honestly so tough to guard any of these players on a consistent basis. It's almost next to impossible. The one thing that I do is get bumpy with them. Pause, but you got to get bumpy, okay? You'll get some bump steals here and there um, and make them uncomfortable with the ball. A lot of times, whoever is guarding the inbounder, in, in this case, it's Robert Covington. As Magic's coming up the court, you will see a lot of guys holding R2 and spamming these moves, whether it's uh, Ben Simmons between the legs, between the legs, uh, Magic's behind the back, or Giannis is behind the back. They just spam him up the court. So you know what he's going to do. He's going to do it behind the back here. I'm waiting for it. And, and as you guys can see, perfect position, Cub gets the bump steal, and we're going the other way. Okay, It's those simple animations that, may, that will make a big difference. You guys will see the improvements. Um, and, and it's just it's all about outthinking your opponent, making them uncomfortable, making them think even even three steps harder than, than they should be thinking. Um, and just because if they get comfortable with Ben, Magic, or Giannis, it's going to be tough. So they have they should have to think every time they bring the ball up the court um, and just be relentless with it. Don't give up if, if after three or four times if you can't get a steal. All, you, all it takes is, is 10%. You know, say if you can get a steal on one out of every 10 possessions, that will make an impact and make them uncomfortable with the ball. In this situation, I went for the bump steal, didn't get it. Um, and so it, it's it, he has an advantage right now. He has an advantage. I click on Roco, give him a little something different because I don't want to rotate with Jonathan Isaac here. I wanted to show him something different, something he hasn't seen yet. Rotate with Cub. He sees it, right? He sees it. Um, there's two options for him. He can go brain dead, go up, um, hop step in the lane, and kick it to Josh Smith, or just take a mid range jumper. Let's see what he does. Um, and you, I, hold up, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta show this. Okay, so I come over with Cub. He sees that. Okay, he's made his decision right now. The guy I'm playing knows what he is going to do at this point. Um, so as you guys see, I click on Cam Reddish, thinking one step ahead. He tries dot in the corner. That's a steal every single time. Like I said, people think too fast in this game almost. They just they think too fast, make the obvious pass, make the obvious read. And, and that's where, as a defensive player, you can excel from your competition. This is another example. After a made basket, you guys know what's coming, okay? He gets in his five out. I'm trying to get bumpy, show him different looks. He's uncomfortable right now. Look at him. He's uncomfortable. He's rattled. He doesn't know where to throw the ball. He thinks he has, like, he literally has nowhere to go with it. Um, I'm playing gaps. I'm doing everything I can. He thinks he's got that. Jonathan Isaac pinches. You guys see, look at the five out. He He's trying to five out. Look at it. His spacing is just not there. Um, if he tries to dot KG, he won't be able to get a shot off. Um, if he tries splitting it, it's going to be a steal. He's really got nowhere to go with the ball, and that's just a perfect pinch steal right there. So anyway, that is the video. An hour and 10 or so minutes. This is a lot longer than I thought, but you know what? This is thorough enough that it should be the only guide you really, really need for NBA 2K20, my team. You should be perfectly perfectly fine with not watching another tip video for the year after this to be completely honest in terms of team building and everything but uh yeah that's kind of what the point of this was a huge huge thank you to all of the other youtubers for having me out with this video because i'm good at certain things i'm good at team building i'm good at finding budget cards i am by no means a defensive player of ty i by no means know playbooks like bio and i'm by no means a sniper of energetic or the investor of jd so a big big thank you to those guys for helping me out maybe an ideal situation i could have gotten someone in to go over a little bit more about the basics of offense but i think my offense is good enough that i can do a fairly okay job on that but anyway that's the video thank you guys for watching please like comment and subscribe to this channel and all of the other channels